Hello and welcome to Scotty Kilmer Live Car Talk Podcast. I've been working cars for 51 years. I'm here to answer your car questions. You notice there's no advertisements flying on the screen. There's no sponsors, just the truth. You want to know about cars? I'll help you out. Anybody in the world. Just remember, ask your questions in the live chat. I pick the best ones, answer them during the show. Okay, the first question is RM, and he says, what can you do to tune up an old car with about 155,000 miles on it? I'm getting worse gas mileage than before. Just want to know if there's anything I can do. Thanks. Of course, you want to start with the basics. You want to make sure the spark plugs are good. Take out one and check it. The air filter is clean. The fuel filter is clean. You want to do the basic things. Now, if all that is done and it still gets bad gas mods, then you got to get into the more complex thing. I have a video called Make Your Car Run Better with a Little Spray Cleaner. And in that video, I show you how you get two cans of spray cleaner, they're different kinds, and how to clean the fuel injection system. You try that one next because when you get further than that, sometimes you have to either buy new fuel injectors or if your engine's wearing out and need a valve job, that gets very expensive. Always try the simple things first. And of course, cleaning the sensors that I show in that video are a really good way in a car that's older that has got built dirt build up on it. You haven't cleaned in quite some time. Next question. Mudasir Habib asks, is changing the engine in a Corolla E80 a good idea? I've had this car since 1990 and the engine block's cracked. The car body's in good condition though. Okay, if in your area you can do what I've done for decades and find one of those used Japanese engines that's imported from Japan, go right ahead. I did that for my son years ago. I bought a 93 Toyota Celica that was a beautiful car, but the woman that loaned it to her daughter and her goofball daughter drove it through water, sucked water, and blew the engine up. So I went to one of the local junkyards here that imports these engines from Japan. And I got an engine for 500 bucks. It probably had less than 20,000 miles because 10 years later, it's still running like a clock and it never burned any oil. So if you can get one of those used Japanese engines from Japan, do it and put it in because those are excellent engines. And in Japan, they don't put that many mileage on the cars, I guess. Now, if you're talking about just putting a regular junkyard engine, I wouldn't bother to have too many miles on it, probably. But if you can get one of those Japanese ones, go right ahead and do it. Next question. Ethan Barker says, Scotty, what do you think of the Toyota Igo? It's very reliable and popular car here in Israel. Yeah, now, they don't sell them over here in the United States. But here's the thing. Toyota has kind of a world universal platform. They use the same engines and transmissions and brakes on many of their different models, and they just give them different names. So I'm sure that that's equivalent to some kind of car that they sell in the United States. Now, if they don't sell one, say it's a really small car, and they don't sell it over here. I know in Singapore, they sell a lot of micro cars that they don't sell over here. But my son's uh, wife is from Singapore, and uh, the people there love them. So, you know, Toyota makes reputable cars. There's no arguing that. And the only problem that I've seen from some people in other parts of the world in the United States with Toyotas is sometimes they're hard to get parts for if they don't sell a lot of them in that country. So a lot of people will go out and buy a car that they can get parts more readily available for. Here in the United States, it's simple to get parts for Toyotas and no one cares. If you can get parts for them in there, Israel, go right ahead. I'm sure they're great cars. Next question. Sky High says, is the ECU remap recommended for performance upgrade? Okay, here's the thing. That can only be done by an absolute pro. The computer in your car is set up to have the best power for the best gas mileage and the best long life of the engine. The engineer spent a lot of time designing that stuff, you know? So you don't want to be questioning what they said. Now, if you want to get more performance, 
the ECUs can be reprogrammed and upgraded, but it has to be done by a pro who knows what he's doing. And realize if they do set it up and you get more performance, that you're also going to get worse gas mileage. And generally, the engine's going to wear out a little bit faster, too. And in some areas, it's illegal because it will make the car fail the emissions test. If you remember when Volkswagen got caught with their diesels, they had one set up in the computers that made them get better fuel mileage and run, but they polluted more. And then when they were being inspected and it knew it was on a dyno, they went to a different system and the computer made it not pollute as much, but have worse power. Now, you know, you really don't want to mess around with that stuff because if it's done wrong, you're going to have all kinds of problems. But if you really want to try, you got to find a pro who knows how to do it, who has a five gas analyzer, a dynamometer, and really knows how to do that stuff. It's not something that anybody can just go and do. Glenn Lego says, can you offer an opinion on putting nitrogen in tires rather than air? Okay, here's the thing. We live on Earth. The atmosphere of Earth is something like 80% nitrogen anyways. So if you're putting pure nitrogen in your tires, you're only getting rid of 20% of the other gas that's in there, oxygen and stuff, and having total nitrogen in it. Now they do that on race cars. They also do it on big jet planes because the jet planes are way up in the sky where it's really cold. And the nitrogen doesn't it's totally dry, and it's not like the oxygen. It doesn't lose pressure as much. It's an inert gas as the oxygen does. And, yeah, it's a good idea, and for the race cars, too. But for normal driving, it really doesn't make all that much difference. For years, guys are trying to sell me one of these machines that makes nitrogen. All it does is, is keep purifying the, America, the air in our Earth's atmosphere until it's almost 100% nitrogen. Uh, it doesn't massive, you magically get nitrogen from nowhere. It just keeps getting rid of everything else. But from what I've seen, it does absolutely nothing. And then, uh, if you ever have to add air to your tire, you'd have to go someplace that has just the nitrogen instead of just having an air pump. Eh, it doesn't really do that much. I wouldn't waste my time if I were you. Next question. Kabul Budenshaw says, Scotty, what do you think about the Mini Cooper? Okay, the original Minis were a very interesting design that the English did. I believe it was like the 1950s, and they started, and they made a really reliable front-wheel drive car. It was a little bitty thing, didn't go all that fast, but they sold millions of them because the English didn't have much money, and it was a car and not a motorcycle with a sidecar stuck on it. Now, the Mini Coopers, when they brought them back a while ago, they are a BMW pretty much company. And they, as they age, are endless money pits. My neighbor has one. She's on her third one. Uh, the first one, just uh, the engine wore out, blew up. And I've worked on it where I had to rewire stuff because the wiring was so cheap and thin that it just, the insulation cracked and started to short up. I would not advise anybody to buy one because they are money pits. Being BMW products, the parts cost a fortune. I had to get a brake caliper for one. It was like $750. And it's very hard here in the United States to get aftermarket parts for them. So I would not advise anybody to buy one. Next question. Zero says, Scotty, I'm looking to get a Camaro 2017 as a first car. How reliable is the V6? Well, the V8s are their uh, money makers, and they're decent engines. They're fast, they're well made. The V6, eh, most guys don't want a Camaro with a V6. Now, if you drive it conservatively, I mean, what would be the point of buying a Camaro and driving it conservatively? But if you do, could last a while, but the GM V6 engines have always been on the weak side that they used in the Camaros, and uh, I've had customers with them that the engines went out early or they burn a lot of oil. If you want a Camaro, you're really better with a V8 and not messing with the V6, because uh, then if you're going to sell it later, you're not going to get much for it, because they all want the V8s. Nobody wants to buy the V6 used in those things. Next question. Uh, 
Alexander Granada says, Scotty, why aren't the Toyota Land Cruiser sold in the USA? Well, maybe you're in an alternate universe because I worked on many of them were sold in the USA. They sold Land Cruisers a long time ago in the United States. I remember when they had them and they had that, basically it was a Chevy six-cylinder straight in-line engine that they threw in those things. They sell them in the United States and they have for quite some time. Uh, they're very reliable vehicles. They're extremely gas hogs. They use a lot of fuel. And, uh, but they can last a long time. I had a customer with one that had 500,000 miles on a thing and it was still running pretty good. So you might check something there because they've been sold there for quite some time. <laughs> Next question. Chadramuli. Swaminathan says, he's probably going to kill me for pronouncing his name wrong. Scotty, my 07 Corolla is an air conditioner issue. My mechanic wants to change the coil in India. It costs about 600 bucks for the coil. Should I go ahead and change the coil or change my car? Okay, well, that's crazy. Coils are a lot less than that. You might check aftermarket for stuff like that. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, I don't believe in changing air conditioner coils. The air conditioner compressor is about this big, and it's got the compressor unit, and then the clutch bolts on, and the coils inside the clutch assembly. If the clutch goes bad, generally, it's because something's wrong with the compressor, and it overheats the coil and burns it out. So it's not a good idea ever to just change a coil in an air conditioner, because if you do, it's probably going to bite you in the rear end, and then after a period of time, that one's going to burn out too. You're better to change the entire compressor than you are. And I mean, really, here in, in Texas, I can get the compressor and coil and everything brand new from China, and maybe 250 bucks. And you're in India. That's a lot closer to China. You should be able to get those things a lot cheaper. I would look for another mechanic if I were you. Next question. Day Machine says, are LEDs better than regular bulbs? And what are the pros and cons of both bulbs? Okay, here's the thing. There's pros and cons both ways. Now, LEDs are light-emitting diodes. Well, light-emitting diodes, they use less energy, and they're a lot cooler. I did a, a video a while back where I showed that, uh, hey, if you... Uh, check the temperature of halogen light bulbs for your headlights. It was like, I don't know, 800 degrees or something. And then you put LED bulbs and turn them on and they are like 105 degrees. So they're a lot cooler. They use a lot less energy. But for you northern people that live where it gets icy and cold, you would rather have halogen because if you got LED bulbs, you turn them on. It's never going to melt the ice and snow on your headlights. <laughs> Well, the halogens will get hot enough to melt them. So sometimes it's better to have halogen lights. Now, LED lights, since they use less energy, it's more efficient and stuff. But really, uh, maybe get one one thousandth of a mile better gas mileage putting in LED bulbs versus halogen. It really isn't going to make all that much difference. <laughs> And, of course, they come in various colors, the LEDs, and some guys go for the different colors, and that's why people use them. They want one particular color versus another. Next question. DW says, what GM vehicle would be worth buying? Okay, an old one <laughs> that was either taken care of and done over, like... Uh, and a, uh, a 57 Chevy Bel Air, or for that matter, a uh, 67 Chevy Bel Air. Those things were well made and last a long time. GM's quality control has just been going downhill for decades. There's no way out of it. Uh, they want to make as much profit as they can, and so they're making them as cheap as they possibly can, and they pay their workers as little as they possibly can, so all the people at the top and the stockholders can make a profit. Uh, and it's just a bad scene. I mean, they get too much into planned obsolescence and too much into lowering quality. And it's a shame, but that's the way that it goes. I mean, I learned to drive on a, a Chevy Biscayne. Biscayne, it was basically a cheap version of a 67 Bel Air. It's just a cheaper version. And those things could run forever, but not anymore. The quality is just gone. They just have lost their quality. And if you check the resale value of modern GM vehicles, man, it's low. You can pick them up used cheap. And the reason is they're not that well made. Next question. 
Kenneth K says, hey, Scotty, what do you think of the 2019 Nissan Altima CVT and the 2019 VW Passat? Thanks. Okay. Well, out of those two, if you had to buy one, I wouldn't buy either. But if you had to buy one, I'd buy the Volkswagen. You'd be pretty shocked that that's always down to Volkswagens. If the Volkswagen had a standard transmission, I would buy the Volkswagen. The Nissan, they've had nothing but problems with their transmissions to begin with. And the CVTs are even worse than their regular automatic transmissions. It's kind of weird, but Nissan has a company that made the Jatco transmissions. It's, it's split off from Nissan, but it's still owned mainly by Nissan. It's called Jatco. And all their CVT transmissions are made by Jatco. And they're like the worst in the world. Even the Volkswagen transmissions are better than that. So if you had to buy one of those, I'd buy the Volkswagen, which is going to shock people because I always tell people not to buy Volkswagens, but you're doing a bad apple versus a less bad apple there. Next question. Laser Man says, Scotty, what do you think of uh, Toyota forklifts? Okay, they're fantastic forklifts. I mean, they made them in the United States for decades. And the guys I know that have forklifts, they swear by the Toyotas. They just seem to run forever like a, the old Toyota stuff was indestructible. And that's why they sold so many of them. I mean, they made most of them. I believe it was Indiana where they made them. Those Toyota forklifts can last basically forever if people take care of them. I had a guy down the road who had a golf cart business, and uh, he used the forklifts to pick the golf carts up to either work on them or put them in people's trucks when they took them away after he fixed them, and uh, that thing was, well, I don't know, it was 30-something years old, the tires were all rotten and everything, but it still ran like a clock. Next question. JDM says, Scotty, what do you think of the future of lead-acid batteries will be? Will we keep buying them 10, 20, 30 years from now as a reliable source to power some uh, electronics? Well, uh, there are many different types of batteries out there, and the lead acid has been around for so long, and it works. It's good for starting up internal combustion engines where you need strong, powerful batteries. Now, as a counterpoint to that, in my Triumph motorcycle, I have a, I don't have a lead acid battery. It came with one, and I took it out, and I put in a lithium iron battery, not a lithium ion, but a lithium iron battery. And it wasn't bad for, it was just 10 bucks more than the, the lead acid battery. It cost me like 80 bucks for the lithium iron battery. And that thing, I'm not making this up. I got a 900cc motorcycle. It's, 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 it takes something to turn it over, two cylinder. It can sit there for a year, not touched. And I can turn the key on, push the starter button, it'll start right up. But the problem is, it's a motorcycle. The bigger batteries, they do make lithium iron batteries that you can put in a car, but they're like $900 or more. People don't want to spend that. Maybe the technology will change and they'll get cheaper and we'll have lithium iron batteries in our cars. But who knows? For now, the lead acid batteries work quite well and they're not all that expensive, so we'll probably still be using them for quite some time. Next question. Melissa Crenshaw says, I got an 07 Dodge Nitro SLT. I've had it since March of last year. I've had numerous electrical issues. Had my front drive shaft replaced. Should I get out of this vehicle? Try it in. Okay. Yes, they're rolling piles of garbage. <laughs> Unfortunately, you bought it. But let's see. You've had it since March of last year, and it's 12 year olds now. I hope you didn't pay much for it. If you didn't pay much for it, get rid of it for whatever you get. But if you paid a reasonable amount and you can't sell it for any kind of decent money, drive it till the wheels fall off. But if you can sell it for any decent money, definitely sell it now. Those were one of the worst vehicles I ever made. They were just junk. Uh, when you do buy a used car, find a guy like me, a real mechanic, that's going to tell you what cars are good and what cars are bad. And go buy what they say. Over the years, I've told lots of people what cars to buy. And I mean, I had one customer who was a lawyer. He didn't listen to me. He bought a Jaguar. Of course, it fell apart. And I just laughed at him. I really did. I said, I told you not to buy that Jaguar. You bought it. And then, you know, after two, three years, the thing was falling apart. So listen to an honest mechanic when they tell you something. Rick Davison says, my gal left love stains on my leather seats. How do I remove stains? 
Okay. Leather stains are not that hard to get out because the leather is treated. I use the stuff that's made in England. If you just go to the Scotty Kilmer channel or to Google and type in cleaning and preserving leather seats, Scotty, you'll see that video. It shows the whole thing. The kit comes with a cleaner, then it comes with a preservative, comes with the little uh, simple scrubber. It's not going to hurt the seats, but it's a little bit rough that you spray the cleaner on, and that stuff works, and when you're done, you preserve it. I just did the seats in my wife's Lexus. She said, wow, they look brand new now, and it really does work. So you can do that. Just watch that video. Next question. Jordan Davenport says, Hey, Scotty, my dad's a master tech, but whenever I ask him a question, he yells at me and doesn't explain my question. That's why I'm asking you questions. Why is that? Okay. Well, to begin with, your father must hate what he does. <laughs> there are a lot of mechanics that have been doing it a while, and they hate it. It drives them nuts. They should have never become a mechanic in the first place. I love explaining things to people. And I'll, that's just how I am. Now, my grandfather was kind of like your father. I learned fixing cars from him, but he wouldn't explain it to me. I worked in the garage that my father in. He was the chief mechanic, but he let me watch. I couldn't ask him questions, but he let me watch. And that's fine with me. I can watch and learn really well. So I just watched him and learned how to do this stuff. So your father probably is one of those guys, just like my grandfather, doesn't like teaching things to people. And if he doesn't, ah, learn it from me instead, you know? Uh, there's lots of people out there that love something. They love talking about it for people. And some people, if they don't, that generally means they don't like what they're doing and they're kind of mad. <laughs> Next question. Levy Partridge says, Scotty, what are your thoughts on running old diesels on used chip fat? You must be English. We call them French fries. And is it worth doing the conversion to a low-value hatchback? Not sure if it's a common thing in the U.S. Thanks. Okay. If you want to go through the trouble, yeah, if you can keep getting the chip fat free, I had a customer that did that. The problem is you have to get a system that is both a filtration system and a heating system because at certain temperatures, that chip fat congeals. So you got to have a thing that warms it up, a preheater. So there's a lot of stuff that you have to do. You still have to keep a regular bit of diesel tank in it and then switch it over because it won't start up on that stuff. You got to start it up with diesel fuel and the glow plugs. And once it starts running, then you flip a switch and then it turns it over to the chip fat. It's doable. I know a guy did it in an old school book. Us, drove to Alaska and back and stuff, but you do have to put the whole system on, and you might want to look into England there and see what an entire conversion kit costs, then you can decide you want to do it or not. Next question. John Jeffrey Angeli says, Scotty, would you recommend buying a late 90s Nissan Sentra as a first car? How's the reliability? From what I see, they cost about a grand. Is it worth it? From the Philippines. Okay. Those are great cars in the 90s. I had customers with those things that got 300,000 pretty much trouble-free miles in them. They were well made. Back then, even the automatic transmissions were well made. I got a customer still driving one. It's kind of beat up looking, but it still runs and shifts and goes down the road. So you're in the Philippines. I'm assuming things don't rust there, so you're not going to get rust. You don't have real winners or anything there. So, hey, if you can get one for a 1000 bucks and it still runs, it's probably not a bad idea for using for just run around transportation. Next question. Andrew, King Andrew 900 says, what's the best way to find a good used car? Okay. Word of mouth, of course. Tell your friends and everybody you know you're looking for a good used car because uh, a lot of times uh, maybe some granny uh, can't see well anymore and she's got to sell her car. Or maybe there's an estate sale somewhere and you can get a good used car that way. You don't want to start up and just go to car lots because car lots, they're pros. If you go to a used car lot, generally the price they're asking is anywhere from three to five times what they paid for the car. So you want to find a car where they bought the car. Now, don't 
Do this, though. I've had customers say, oh, I'm going to go to a car auction and buy a used car. Don't do that unless you're a pro. Because there's a lot of junky cars in auctions, and you might just end up buying another junky car. So don't go to an auction for that. But try privately with people and tell everybody you know. Uh, I've used Craigslist myself, but the problem with that is you got to be a pretty good mechanic because a lot of the Craigslist cars are junk, and you're just going to waste your time driving around seeing one junk car after another. You want to try word of mouth first. Next question. Aaron Aaron says, hey, Scotty, I got a cheap Saturn SL2 sedan with low miles. It needs some minor repairs. Are these reliable cars? Okay. Now, Saturns, I'm never a fan of Saturns. You know, it was just GM and they made another factory on the East Coast and said, oh, we'll call it Saturns. And, oh, you know, you can have your summer vacation and visit our factory. It was a real crazy PR. As a matter of fact, one of my ex-customers moved to San Francisco and he was the guy behind that whole PR scheme that they were doing. But... They weren't terrible cars. And if you get them used, they can last quite some time. I've had a handful of customers that bought used Saturns for anywhere from $500 to $1,500 and then drove them for four or five years. So, you know, you can still get parts for them and stuff. But my advice with Saturns are, if you're going to buy a Saturn, get the four-cylinder. Don't get the V6. The V6 engines had all kinds of problems, cost a fortune to fix. But the four-cylinder engines were a lot more reliable. If you do want to get a Saturn, get one of those four-cylinder ones. Next question. Mark Gordon says, Scotty, got an 04 Mustang with PO171. PO173, is it a vacuum leak? Most likely. Okay, when they run lean, a lot of times it's a vacuum leak. So watch my video, Finding Engine Vacuum Leaks with a Cigar, so you can blow smoke in, find where it's coming out. Do check that. That's the most common thing. But there's a lot of things that you can uh, get uh, running lean. If your MAF sensor is dirty, it can run lean. If your fuel pump is weak, it doesn't pump enough volume fuel, and the car runs lean. There's a lot of things that can make a car run lean, but vacuum leaks are the easiest thing to check, and the most common on a vehicle like that that's, what, 15 years old. Rubber hoses crack, gaskets that leak, so you want to check that first. Next question. Denny Lee says, I bought some Goodyear AT tires for my truck and had all the scheduled maintenance, wheel alignments done, and they only have 15,000 miles and they're almost worn out. Okay, well, there's something wrong with your alignment. Or your shocks are worn out. Something is wrong. They don't wear out that fast. Unless they're not rolling down the road correctly. As long as you kept air in those tires. I mean, if you didn't, and you're driving around with 15 pounds of air and the pressure, then sure, it's going to wear the tires out too. But I would take your car, the way it stands now with worn out tires, to a good friend in alignment shop. Whoever you've been using doesn't sound like they know what they're doing and haven't checked the suspension and the alignment and see what's wrong before you buy any more tires. Those, those are decent tires, and they're not going to wear out that fast unless there's something wrong. Or unless you drive like an absolute maniac and are burning out all the time, you can run tires out in 500 miles if you burn them out all the time. <laughs> Next question. Okay, Eric Carabolo says, Scotty, what do you think about a 2006 to 12 Mitsubishi Eclipse GS or GT? Okay, I'm not a Mitsubishi fan, but if you're getting one of those with a standard transmission and you take care of them and change the oil regularly, they can be good transportation, fun and zippy little cars. That said, don't ever buy one with an automatic transmission. They're absolute piles of junk. And the advantage of if you buy a used one of those is, yeah, the Toyotas are going to outlast them a lot. 
But the Toyotas always go for a lot more money even used. And if you can find one of those at a decent price with a standard transmission, hey, you can get your money's worth out of it. I've had customers buy those things used for a couple of grand and drive them for sometimes six, eight years more. Hey, they're making out like gangbusters that way. I'd never buy a new one because they're too expensive for what you get. But you can get a used one cheap enough. Why not? Next question. Something random asks, Scotty, what's your opinion on a 2007 to 2014 Cadillac Escalade? Okay, they're endless money pits. All my customers with them as they aged, everything was breaking electronically. Some of them, the transmissions went out, and a lot of them started burning engine oil as they got older. The quality of Cadillac is long gone. In my, my grandfather's days, you know, in the 1940s and 50s and early 60s, they were just bulletproof vehicles that run forever, but not anymore. I, I wouldn't buy a new one. And now, if you could get a used one dirt cheap and you're using it kind of as a toy on the weekends, and it runs good now, you get it cheap, eh, maybe go ahead. But in the long run, they're not that great vehicles. You're not going to get your money's worth out of them. Well, that's it for this week. Remember, every day of the week, I upload two videos on the Scotty Kilmer channel on YouTube. So subscribe and hit that notifications bell so you never miss one of my new videos. I'm here every Saturday on YouTube Live, answering your questions live all over the world at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. And also Thursday, I'm on YouTube Live at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. So if I don't catch you between now and then, I'll see you on Thursday.